Hello everyone, welcome to this video, which I call speech features for NLP people. It's not entirely accurate. What I've found is often when I'm working with um, students or people coming from a strong natural language processing background or a strong computer science background, they will actually have a lot of the skills required for working with speech and doing speech processing. But the basic requirements from signal processing is a little bit missing. And that's why I wanted to make this video. So despite the title, it's really for anyone that has uh, some mathematical background, knows about um, programming and so on, but just struggles to basically see how you go from a waveform to something that you can um, process in a computer. So it's really the bare minimum that you need to know about signal processing can be for computer scientists or maybe you're a mechanical engineer and you just want to know how do I get the speech uh, signal in a way that I can do something with it. So this video is really just that it um, will show you the absolute minimum and maybe go goes a little bit beyond just the minimum that you need to know in order to take this further and and do stuff with speech. So let's say we've got some waveform. This is something traveling through the air, right? And maybe it looks something like this, um, where basically we've got time running along this axis. Then what we can do is we can look at the spectrum of the signal. This tells us basically what the frequency content of this signal is. Now I don't know what the spectrum of this signal looks like, but let's just make something up. Let's say it looks something like this. Okay, um, and now what we've got here is on this axis, we've got frequency. Okay, so this is a function of, of frequencies. And here we've got this signal is in the time domain, right? Because we've got time running this way. And now we go from this signal to this signal is something called the Fourier transform. Okay, so this signal, they're a little pair, and this is called the Fourier transform. Okay, now... Let's just think about this intuitively. What the Fourier transform or the spectrum tells us is basically the frequency content in this signal. If we've got stuff that are basically oscillating very quickly, then we will have energy like little bumps um, at high frequencies. If we've got things that's oscillating slowly, then it will be at lower frequencies. Now with something like speech, what our ears actually care most about is the frequency content in the signals. And that's why it's, it's important to be able to think about the spectrum of a signal. Now, the signal that I drew here, when we want to process it with a, with a computer, we can't actually input this um, signal directly. So what we're going to do is our uh, microphones are going to sample that signal in a way. And that basically means that we're only keeping uh, like little snapshots of the signal as we're going um, as we're going across okay so let me just draw that out um, underneath the signal so here I've got that the original signal but what we're going to keep is only these little snapshots along the way and we call them samples and normally what we do is we keep samples every um, you know few seconds every few milliseconds um, and what we think about is that the time between two samples here for instance this time between that sample and the next sample this time will be um, it's called the period but it's one over what we call the sampling frequency okay so that's the time that goes between the little snapshots okay now after we've got all these snapshots we st store them all in one long list and we can think of that as I draw these square brackets. So instead of being a function of time, this thing is basically a function of uh, the sample number. So you can have a sample zero, sample one, sample 10, whatever. Okay. And this list of numbers is really what's stored on your computer when you, for instance, have uh, a speech signal. Um, and each point, you can think of that as uh, normally we sample at something like 16,000 hertz which means that each point is one over 16,000th of a second. You get um, one of these points. To take the Fourier transform of something, you actually need to write out the math and do it mathematically. On a computer, we've got a computational way to calculate something similar, and that's called the discrete Fourier transform. 
Okay, and th the algorithm that's used to compute the discrete Fourier transform is called the fast Fourier transform. Now, the fast Fourier transform and the discrete Fourier transform, they're uh, actually the same thing. They calculate the same numbers. The fast Fourier transform is just an implementation of the discrete Fourier transform. And it's different from the Fourier transform, but it still tells you basically what's happening at different frequencies in your signal. Okay, so let's just uh, do this little pair thingy. Um, and now, again, instead of having um, this continuous signal in the, in the frequency domain, what we're going to do is we're going to get a list of um, little numbers, just samples, in, uh, when we take the, the DFT. Okay? So it's not a continuous thing. It's basically these um, samples, just like we had in the time domain. Now we're just having samples in the, in the frequency domain. And that's pretty neat because it's easy for a computer to store a list of numbers. Um, and what we will have here is just a list of numbers again. Okay. And to indicate that it's a discrete list of numbers, again, I'll just use square brackets. So capital X K, that is the discrete Fourier transform of little X N. All that we're doing is we're basically taking a list of numbers. Let's write them out. So we've got X zero, which is our first sample. Then we've got x1, which is our second sample, x2, and so on. It's just a list of numbers up to x, let's write it capital N minus 1. So then we've got n points here. That's what we're putting into the discrete Fourier transform. And what comes out on the other side is also just, again, a list of number, capital X0, capital X1, and so on, up to capital X N minus 1. Okay. And these numbers, they tell us what's happening at different frequencies. Um, maybe I should give you the little cheat sheet here. But X, capital X, little k, um, tells us uh, what happens at the frequency corresponding to little k over n times my sampling frequency. Okay. So if I'm at sample number 20, then 20 divided by the total number of stuff that I put in, multiplied by my sampling frequency, um, capital X 20, that tells me what's happening at that, um, at that frequency. Um, something else to say here is that these numbers are actually complex. Now I don't want you to worry about that too much. If you know what a complex number is, normally what we do is we just look at the magnitude of them because that tells us um, basically the amount of energy at that specific um, frequency. So we're just taking the amplitude. So if you don't know what a complex number is, don't worry about that too much. You'll just see in the code in a second that we often do uh, numpy np.abs, um, which just takes the absolute value of a number. The important thing is that if you have a high number at the coefficient at that frequency, for example, then we know that the input has energy at that frequency component. If we've got stuff that goes quickly here, then we're going to have bumps at higher frequencies. If we've got a component that goes slower, then we're going to have bumps at lower frequencies. And speech is a complicated signal. So normally we have things happening at multiple frequencies at the same time. And the cool thing about the discrete Fourier transform is that it will show that to us. So if you have something that has both lower and higher frequency components, it's very, very hard to see that by just looking at the plot. But if you look at the discrete Fourier transform, if you have stuff at both higher and lower frequencies, then you'll have a bump here as well as a bump here. Uh, I should maybe quickly just say that frequency uh, is measured in hertz, and hertz is just the number of cycles per second. Okay, um, so this here, so xk tells us what happens, xk tells us what happens at k over n times fs, this will be in hertz. Let's quickly switch to looking at this um, in practice, right? What happens on a computer, because otherwise this just won't make sense. Okay, so you've got a little Python Jupyter notebook um, that we'll just use to illustrate some things. Um, I've just got some preliminary stuff, importing things. Okay, now let's let's listen and then look at uh, at the signal. So here 
what I have is I've got a little perfect sinusoidal signal. This is something that just goes, that's just perfectly sinusoidal. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to vary how many cycles we have in a second and then just look at the spectrum. First signal is a 300 hertz signal. That means we've got 300 of these cycles in, in a single second. Okay, so our ears, that's a pretty low frequency. And what you can see here is what I've done was I've calculated the fast Fourier transform. I'll speak about this other stuff. Uh, a little bit later on, so don't worry about it now. But the important thing is here we calculate the discrete Fourier transform and we use the fast Fourier transform, which is just the implementation of the discrete Fourier transform. Okay. And then what I do is I actually plot the spectrum here. And what you can see here, here we've got amplitude, here I've just written this as the, the frequencies. It's important that um, I draw this as a continuous line, but really there's little samples everywhere. We'll plot them in a second. Um, okay, cool. So here what we've got is we've got a 300 hertz signal. And what you can see here is here we've got a little spike exactly at 300 hertz. Okay, cool. Let's change that to 600 hertz. I left myself a little note there. Okay. And what you can see, we haven't listened to it yet. But what you can see is that we've got the spike at 600 hertz, which is exactly what we want. Okay, high frequency. Cool. Now, these are, this is actually, you know, perfect signals, right? Um, so we're going to look at some actual non-perfect real world signals in a second. Let me just quickly show you just that these things are just really just numbers, okay? So our input X, which is in the time domain, these little samples, they're just a list of numbers. So the first thing is at zero, the next has an amplitude of 0 0.223. In other words, these blue dots that we have here, the first one, the very first one would be at zero, the next one will be at 0 0.233, the next one will be at 0 0.4, and so on. That's what goes into the DFT. And what comes out is again, just a list of numbers. Okay, now they're going to look complex, so don't worry about it for, for a second. Okay, they look crazy, but let's just take the, take the absolute value of that. Um, it's just again, okay, these numbers are very small because we're looking at the numbers here. At some point it goes very big and that's where we we know we've got frequency content at, at that specific sample. But again, it's just a list of numbers. So this is sample number two. So that will tell me what's happening at two divided by the number of points in X. Let's just see how many points there are in X. N. Okay, 32,000, that's a lot. 32,000 times my sampling frequency, which in this case, I forgot what it is. It's 16,000. 16,000 hertz. Okay, so you calculate that. Uh, do you want me to do it? Let's do it quickly. 2 divided by 32,000 times, I should probably be able to do this in my head, but obviously I can't. Okay, so at 1 hertz, this is um, this is the kind of you know the amplitude of the discrete Fourier transform at one hertz, and you can go through all the samples like that. And now let's actually look at a real signal. So the signal I'm going to play for you is a C major chord. Let's just listen to that. Play it again. It's pretty. I like guitars. And now what we can do is we can calculate the discrete Fourier transform of that little signal. Okay, and that's what I do at the bottom here. And now what you see is that a guitar chord is kind of a complex signal. So it has frequency components all over the place. And I've just zoomed in uh, on the frequency axis from 0 to 500 hertz. And what you can see here is like little bumps at different frequencies. Now the cool thing is, if you go on Wikipedia, that's what I do often, you can go and look at what are the notes that makes up a C chord on a, on a guitar. And then you will see numbers like these. I think this is straight from Wikipedia. For a C chord, you have 131 hertz, which is the C note, the E note, the G note, C note, E note, and so on. You can see uh, their frequencies there. And what we've done is we've calculated the DFT, and now you can go and look at these little uh, bumps and you can see that there's stuff going on at 
131 hertz, right? I'm just mapping what's there to this axis. And you can see we've got a little bump at 165 hertz. So that's the E note. And then we've got the G note there. Um, then we've got another C note at 262 hertz, which is exactly double the 131 hertz. So we've got a little other bump there and so on. You can actually go and see that these other bumps are just multiples of one of the earlier notes. Um, so you get that out as well. So that's pretty cool, right? And this is a real signal, it's a real guitar chord, and we can already start to see how the DFT helps us unpack the different frequencies that's going on in a specific signal. So let's look at some speech. I guess it's in the title that we're looking at speech, so we need to. Um, this is just, I think, someone saying a specific vowel. A. Okay. A. Um, here I've just plotted the, the raw samples, a little snapshot of the speech, okay? It looks quite hectic. It's very hard from this signal to see what's going on inside that, um, that uh, little audio clip. And again, what we can do is we can plot the spectrum here. Um, and this is what we get out. So again, I've got numpy.f50.f50 uh, and the windowing stuff I'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. And what we get out is uh, is this spectrum here. Um, one thing I should say here is that um, you can see that speech is quite complex, right? It has things going on at, at different frequencies. One thing I want to note here is that I've plot when instead of just plotting the amplitude, instead of just plotting, you know, um, the absolute number of value of XK, what I've done here is I've plotted the log of um, the absolute value. Um, and let me just explain why that is. Let's quickly take out the log and just see what happens then. So, so clearly you can see that there's a lot going on and the DFT tells us um, basically what's going on. But if we take out the log, and I need to take out this line as well, then you can see, okay, we can clearly see some spectral things happening at different frequencies, but we've also lost a lot of the finer grain stuff, which if we put the log back in, you can um, much more clearly see. Now, as a machine learning person, if I were looking just at my features and in the end, right, I want to put in my speech features into some model, um, I would just say, okay, well, taking the log clearly gives me um, the finer grained values and the finer grained view of what I need to do my machine learning. So that's one, just one reason why we would often take the log. Um, there's also a more principled reason, and that is that our ears are also actually um, quite sensitive to different amplitudes. And what I mean with that is that at very, very low intensities, our ears can pick up the difference in magnitude between um, signals, okay? Um, in other words, if stuff, stuff is very soft, um, then my ear is dis, uh, able to distinguish two soft sounds at just slightly different intensities. Much better than it is um, in distinguishing sounds that are much louder, but at different intensities. I hope that makes sense. So if I play you two very loud sounds um, and their amplitudes are just slightly different, it will be much harder for your ear to distinguish those sounds than it is when I play you two soft sounds with slightly different amplitudes. Um, and that means that, let's take out the log again, uh, Fudge. That means that here we've got very low intensities, right? But our ear might be able to distinguish two things with different amplitudes much better than it would um, things with much higher amplitudes. Okay, and the log actually captures that for us because if we look at the log function, right? Um, this is just great one mathematics, but if you have the log of x here and we've got x on this axis, then we've got a plot going like this, okay? Which means that at, at low amplitudes, low values of x, we'll be able to distinguish things much better than when we have very high values of x where they're much closer together, okay? So that's a bit of a hand-wavy explanation why we often take the log.